The following program is made possible in part by the Dayton Bar Association. your producer and host for today's program and this is the legal program where we get the best and brightest of legal minds in our county and uh, help to illuminate you the viewing public on the status of the law today topic for today's program is going to be bail reform uh, which is a bill presently in our legislature and uh, we're going to be talking about risk assessment uh, and uh, some of the things like that and maybe changing uh, a, a cash bail system. Joining me as a guest for tonight's show, our expert guest is uh, Judge Mary Kate Huffman of the Common Pleas Court. And uh, welcome to you. Thank you. And before we d uh, begin our discussion, let me remind you that You in the Law is a monthly presentation produced here at the studios of the Dayton Access Television. DATV uh, is on Channel 5 and is the public access channel of Spectrum here in Dayton. Uh, programs also cable cast uh, on Channel 6 in the suburbs, so you may be watching it on that. And it is also cable cast on tape delay um, uh, throughout the coming months. Uh, all that through the auspices of the Miami Valley Cable Council. Executive producer for the program is former domestic relations judge uh, Mike Brigner. Um, this is an audience participation show. We're coming to you live and in color and you will see periodically a uh, telephone number, which is, I don't see it right now, but it's 223-5311. And if you have a question for, there it is, uh, for Judge Huffman, uh, please call in. Uh, we also stream live on DATV.org, so if you're watching us on your computer, you already know that. Um, we are sponsored by the Dayton Bar Association, uh, which has been in existence since uh, 1883. Uh, 135 years this year. So we'll talk a little bit about them and uh, what they do for us uh, a little later in the program. Uh, but now let me introduce um, our guest, uh, Judge Mary Kate Huffman, to you. Uh, we will have her introduce herself a little bit more and tell you, the viewing audience, about her background and familiarity with today's topic. Good evening, Judge Good evening, Huffman. Mike. My name is Kate Huffman. I am the administrative judge of the Montgomery County Common Pleas Court General Division. Our court handles civil matters and all of the felony cases in Montgomery County. There are 11 judges on our bench. I am particularly interested in this topic. It has become a bit of, I would say, a hot topic in the, around the United States. Last week I was actually at the Midwest Bail Reform Summit in Indianapolis. Um, we in Montgomery County are engaged in a process of reviewing bail and our pretrial procedures. So this is a, a topic that is very much of interest to me. Okay, thank you. Okay, bail reform. Um, what's the existence of bail today? And obviously it's for people charged with criminal offenses and should they get out? What's the risk? Are they going to show up for court? Things like that. So tell us a little bit about uh, the status of it today and what we hope to uh, accomplish, uh, the legal community, with a reform of th this system. All right, thank you. Well, bail currently in Ohio is, we have a criminal rule of procedure, criminal rule 46, that tells us factors to consider in bond. Um, the rule tells us that every person is entitled to be considered for bond but bond is determined by a variety of factors that are 
uh, uh, designed to influence two or to consider two topics, that being whether the uh, accused is um, a risk of failing to appear in court and if that person is a risk to the community. So public safety and appearance at court are the two factors that are to drive uh, bail or bond decisions. Criminal Rule 46 sets out a number of factors for the court to consider in setting bond. They include the defendant's criminal history, uh, the ties to the community, their education, their employment. Those are all factors that tie that individual to the community. The um, identity of the defendant, that is, has the defendant been identified as the alleged perpetrator of the offense? And then the strength of the evidence um, against the individual. And then finally, whether that person is currently on some sort of supervision, whether it's parole, probation, community control, any other form of supervision. So those are the factors currently enumerated in Criminal Rule 46. Nothing in the Criminal Rule, though, um, looks at the risk of that individual to appear in court or failure to appear in court or the risk that that individual poses to the community. Um, there is no assessment of the individual um, in the current criminal rule. Okay, so how do you do it then? Well, it, it depends on the court. Mm -hmm. um, in general, um, the court looks at information that it has uh, relating to that individual and really makes an assessment about what an appropriate bond should be. <laughs> Municipal courts are permitted by Criminal Rule 46 to have a bond schedule. And that means that the, um, the bond is set based on the offense. So this is just purely by way of an example. If an individual is charged with petty theft, their bond may be $1,000. An individual is charged with trespass, the bond schedule may, be, may um, suggest that the bond is $500. So a bond schedule doesn't look at the defendant as an individual. It looks at purely the crime charged, which doesn't in and of itself relate to the risk to the public or risk to public safety and the um, likelihood that the defendant will appear in court. Well, now there's uh, 88 counties here in Ohio. Is the impetus for this to achieve a uniformity amongst those 88 counties, and is it practical to do so, do you think? We're never going to, com to achieve complete uniformity because judges still have discretion in, in how they set bond. The efforts that are underway, whether it's nationwide or in the state of Ohio, to look at bond or review bond um, are designed to um, be more intelligent about how we set bond. Instead of having a reaction to, you're charged with a particular crime, this seems like a good bond, it, instead, the goal is to be informed mm -hmm. before you set bond. All right. So, have, has there been any studies um, which have determined what some of these uh, factors uh, you may want to have the judge um, determine uh, before they make a, a final um, assessment? That, that's a great question. There are many, many studies that have been done on what are the, the factors that relate to risk for failure to appear in court and uh, potential public safety issues. Some of those factors are things like the, the age of, the, of the first encounter with the criminal justice system. The earlier the age, the greater the likelihood of either failure to appear or um, risk to the public. That factor, like all the other factors, is not determinant of risk. They are factors that influence risk. So again, um, age at first criminal offense, um, criminal history, um, whether the individual is employed, whether they have stable housing, 
whether they are um, uh, engaged in substance abuse, their um, prior um, performance on bond, and by performance I mean did they previously appear in court, have, do they have a history of failure to appear, those are just some of the factors that have been studied and determined to relate to risk of failure to appear and uh, public safety issues. So there are many variables uh, in, involved. Uh, will the risk assessment factors somehow be able to mathematically equate those for the judge, or, or does it become more of an art than a science at some point? Well, the risk assessment tool is often referred to as merely one in the toolbox that the judge has mm -hmm. um, to determine bond. So let me give you an example. If I have a written risk assessment tool that gives me um, sort of a, a, um, an idea of what the risk of a defendant's failure to appear is, but I can look at that individual and see that they appear to be using substances. You, you can often mm -hmm predict that based upon somebody's appearance, that is, their weight, their skin tone, uh, their general demeanor. If I can look at someone, in addition to the, the risk fa factors of the risk assessment, that helps me in determining bond. But if someone is just standing in front of me and I know nothing about them other than what they've been charged with and the fact that they, they look pretty healthy and they don't look like they're under the influence, that doesn't mm -hmm. really give me any information yeah. if that person is a risk to the public or um, a risk of failure to appear in court. Okay. Our floor director tells us we have a call on line one, so we'll take that call. Good evening. You're on You and the Law. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, I uh, have been following the bail reform Somebody's movement over the up. past couple of years, and um, my understanding of the challenges that have happened around the country uh, in different courts and to different systems um, is has to do with the failure of those bail systems to take are, into are account the individual's ability to pay. So uh, what ends up happening is that people who can afford to get out yeah, get out, and here. people who can't afford it end up right. being held pretrial solely because they're too poor to afford the bail, even if they're, um, you know, not particularly dangerous and not a flight risk. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, because I didn't hear you mention it, does Ohio's system take into account failure to pay? I'm sorry, to pay? Um, if not, do you think it is, uh, is that something that is going to be part of the reform, uh, or is Ohio going to be potentially acceptable under those types of challenges? That's great. Okay. Uh, caller. Um, I'm going to have you start over if, if you can. Um, there were technical difficulties in the first part of your call. If that's uh, okay with you, um, to start at the beginning, and we will be glad. Sure. Go sure. ahead. I can, sure. Uh, I can, you want me to repeat the whole question? Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I, what I said was that um, I've been following the bail reform movement around the country. And my understanding of a lot of the challenges that have taken place in different um, parts of the country uh, has to do with the failure of those bail systems to take into account the uh, individual's ability to pay the bail. So what happens in those systems is that people who can afford to get out get out of jail the way they drive, and people who can't. Okay, so your, your question is, but for the ability to pay, the person would probably be 
a good candidate for release? Well, yeah, I think in, in a lot of jurisdictions, they just have a fixed bail schedule, like your guest was saying. Okay. So it's just, if you committed X crime, the bail is X amount of dollars um, without taking into account any other factors. And so if you can't make your bail, uh, you're in jail, even if you're, you know, even if you're innocent or, you know, not dangerous and not a flight risk. Okay. That's a very complex question. First of all, I, I do want to say that in Montgomery County and the Common Pleas Court, we do not use a bail schedule. We have not, I've been on the bench for 16 years. There has not been a bail schedule used in all of that time, and I'm sure many years before that there has not been a bail schedule. We use a verified risk assessment tool um, to help the judge in making the bond decision. The risk assessment tool doesn't make a decision. It is information that helps the judge decide those two factors that you mentioned, which is risk to the um, community and potential failure to appear in court. Um, one of the things driving some of the, the bail review or the pretrial reform review that is going on is the concern that in many courts the current bail system and particularly bail schedules disproportionately affect the poor. And so that is what's the driving movement behind um, a lot of pretrial reform movements. But the risk assessment tool doesn't consider poverty. And let me give you an example. Let's assume that you have a, uh, someone who's accused who um, has $10 million in the bank, and they are accused of murder, and their bond is set at a million dollars. They likely have the ability to post that bond and be out of jail while um, during the pretrial period. But that person is no less a danger or a risk of flight or a risk to the community than a person who has zero dollars in the bank and is charged with the same offense and has their bail set at a million dollars. So what the court should be looking at is risk, risk, as opposed to um, ability to pay. Ability to pay, though, um, is not something that the court could consider. Um, it, is, it is those risk factors in that verified risk assessment tool. Because if we said, person who has $10 million in the bank and you can post bond, uh, well, we'll make your bond $10 million and maybe you'll, you'll show up in court. But person who has no money in the bank and you're also charged with murder, we're going to make your bond an own recognizance bond because you can't afford the million dollars. That person is still a risk to the community and a, a risk of flight. So we can't have ability to pay, be a factor, what, what the bail reform movement is looking at is the focus on um, fewer cash bonds and more bonds that relate to conditions. So the, um, what is an appropriate condition of your bond that will encourage you to appear in court? A condition might be, again, under the appropriate circumstance, that you go for a drug and alcohol assessment. It might be that you check in with a supervising officer twice a week or some other period of time. So instead of focusing on money, the focus is on your what conditions could help you make sure you get to court and make certain that the public is safe. Um, there is also a pretty uh, significant concern that the bail bond industry, those who make money off of bonds, are thwarting efforts to um, have bonds be more, uh, more tied to risk than merely let's have a bond schedule and everybody pays cash. Um, it, that group, the bail bond industry, is a very um, active lobby and they are very um, concerned that if certain bail reform measures take place, whether it's here or throughout the country, that their livelihood may be jeopardized 
And that's not what we should be looking at. We shouldn't be looking at whether the bail industry is making money. We should be looking at whether bond is set appropriate to that individual's risk to the community and, again, risk of failure to appear. I could probably go on for hours about that question. <laughs> it's very, a very complex question, yeah. but as I said, the, the issue of poverty is tied more to the impetus than, than we could tie that to actual bail. Again, the, the movement is away from cash whenever it's appropriate to conditions of release that, again, encourage public safety and encourage um, appearance in court. Okay, well, let's ask our caller. Are you still there? I am still here. Do you have any uh, follow-up on, on your question and Judge uh, Huffman's answer? I, I do. I just two, um, maybe one comment and one question, or I don't know if it's a comment or a question. The first is just um, with regard to the bail industry, uh, I, my understanding is that in a lot of these jurisdictions, the city or county or state has actually elected not to defend their bail system. So they've um, conceded that it's unconstitutional and that, and so the only party that's actually defending the bail systems in those areas are, is actually the bail industry, which has very um, powerful and uh, prestigious lawyers representing them. Um, it but my, I guess my other question or comment is, I, I understand uh, the judge's response when it comes to a crime like murder, but I think that a lot of the concerns about inability to pay has to do with, um, you know, really minor or lesser crimes where the bail would be relatively easy for somebody to make who, you know, is a middle class or or above, you know, a thousand dollars or something, but but that for somebody who's living paycheck to paycheck, um, it becomes very difficult for them to meet that bail, and then they end up just, um, you know, it, it creates sort of a discriminatory system well, it, between people who can afford to pay and people who can't. There is a spiraling effect from being incarcerated pretrial when you are not a risk of flight or risk to the community. It can be employment, it can be stable housing, um, it could be you know loss of custody of your children. There, there are many collateral consequences to pretrial detention, but pretrial detention is appropriate in some circumstances. But you raise the issue of minor offenses, and I, I will tell you that the city of Dayton is really working very hard on um, and, and working with our court on pretrial reforms that, that relate um, to bond um, because, let me give you an example, someone charged with petty theft, uh, that carries a potential of six months of local incarceration and a thousand dollar fine and restitution. If that person has not had any prior criminal offenses, uh, is not a risk of failing to appear because they've never failed to appear before. They have ties to the community, et cetera, it's, and it's a nonviolent offense. Their bond certainly, at least from my perspective, should be an, either an own recognizance or a conditional own recognizance. A cash bond under those circumstances would, and again, in my assessment, never be appropriate. But then take another individual who is charged with petty theft, the same potential penalties, but that person has failed to appear in court, let's say, 10 times, and is um, harassing by telephone or going to the home of the person they allegedly stole from, um, that person may be appropriate for a cash bond. And that bond, though, should be appropriate to encourage appearance in court and encourage the individual to, um, uh, again, not be a risk to, in this case, in, in my example, the victim. So um, cash bail is appropriate sometimes, but the, the national movement, and quite frankly, the local movement, is away from cash bond in the, with the exception of offenses of violence, um, cases where the individual has failed to appear in court, likely repeatedly. 
I do want to make one comment about your statement about um, the bail industry um, uh, defending lawsuits against jurisdictions. I am not familiar with whether the bail industry has been involved with that, but I will tell you there have been a number of lawsuits around the country um, that target communities and the way that the judges in that community set bail. And by and large in those communities, bail is being set on these schedules that we talked about as opposed to the individual assessment. And, um, you know, it's, it's challenging to say to a community, you've been doing it all wrong, you've got to fix it today. Those fixes are systemic. So they may require months to take place, but the, the goal is you've got to be doing it now. You've got to get started on it um, and be engaged in best practices as opposed to having the we've always done it this way attitude. Mm -hmm. That, that yeah. at least in this circumstance, as in many, is not going to work. Well, you're not, well, I don't know. Are, are you thinking that in some communities there might be collusion between the courts and uh, the bail people? I don't think there's, I, look, I have no evidence to support that there would be any collusion, but it's easier, mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's right by any stretch of right. the imagination, it's easier to use a bond schedule and that does benefit the bond industry. I don't think that's right, but for some courts, they lack the personnel, they lack the resources that we have here in mm -hmm. Montgomery County. And, and again, I am not suggesting it's right by any means, but they do not have the resources currently mm -hmm. to engage in the process that, that we engage in. Mm -hmm. um, the bail industry is a very powerful lobby though, and um, again, just from my perspective, it's not appropriate to set bond based upon what the bail industry, you know, what, what's good for their pocketbooks. But you're not thinking of doing away with the bail industry, uh, certainly in cases where the risks entail setting some, some kind of a high cash bail might be the only way the people can actually get out. I think cash bail is always going to have some place, mm -hmm. but it likely will, and it shouldn't, have the place it has had in the past. Okay. Let, let me give you an example, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that I have a 23-year-old pregnant uh, defendant whose um, charge is um, uh, stealing from her grandmother and stealing many times from her grandmother to support her drug habit. Mm -hmm. And that defendant fails to appear in court repeatedly and she's pregnant. There is a great risk to her sure. if she's out of jail. And so sometimes one of the factors that we have to consider is the defendant's safety. Mm -hmm. um, and so a cash bail, as well as conditions for that person may, may be appropriate. So mm -hmm. I, I don't envision that cash bail will be um, uh, a thing of the past, yeah. okay. but certainly the frequency with which cash bail it has been said in the past, we'll that change. undoubtedly will yeah. change. Okay. Are you still with this caller? Well, I think our caller has gotten her answers, and uh, thank you for your call. Uh, thank we, you so much. Oh, you are there. Did you have any follow-up from that? No, I, do, I don't. Uh, I appreciate the answer, and I appreciate you addressing this important topic on your show. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good night. Okay, we're about a little past halfway in the show, so I, I promise there's no commercials on this show. Uh, we are sponsored by the Dayton Bar Association, so we're going to talk a little bit about the Bar Association um, and what they do for us. Uh, I told you they started in 1883. Uh, we've got uh, a variety of topics. Uh, Sally Dunker is, is our new um, director and understandably doing a fine job and lets us continue doing this show, which is, I think is nice. Um, 
Yeah, but, but the Bar Association provides a lawyer referral service um, for assistance in uh, locating uh, lawyers particular to your case, and they have a telephone number of 222-6102. And I understand if you don't have your pen or whatever ready, but if you look on the internet or uh, the phone book, if you still have one, um, you'll find that number. Uh, a notary public service for a with applications and testing. If you or your company needs uh, you to be a notary, um, they provide that uh, service. Uh, a very important uh, program, uh, Wills for Heroes, where volunteer members um, create wills for emergency emergency first responders, uh, firefighters, police, and EMTs. And I think they have that once a month. Have you ever served on that? Or? I, I, because, uh, as a judge, I can't. can't I can't, I can't right. represent okay. anybody, but okay. it, it, every two or three months, it just depending on yeah. um, And they need. didn't have it 16 years ago, probably, did they? Uh, no. Um, I think it's about 10 years old. And they also will do um, an event in conjunction with the uh, Federal Bar Association mm -hmm. for uh, Wills for Vets. Right. So if you fall into any of those categories, we do encourage you to uh, call the Bar Association, find out where uh, these events will take place. They're usually between 10 and 2 or 3 in the afternoon. Uh, um, some of them were at the VFW or the Union Hall or whatever. I think I participated once and that was one of the places. Whether I could find my way back or not, I, I don't know. Um, the Bar Association is pu a public service community and does community service uh, projects. Uh, our, our website is uh, www.dayybar.org, and everything I'm telling you right now, whether it's accurate or not, you could find out the real truth by uh, getting on that. I'm probably pretty close. Um, volunteer Lawyers Project serves the disadvantage, uh, founded and supported by members of the Dayton Bar Association. Um, and I told you about the lawyer referral service. Anything I missed there, you think? Well, the Bar does a lot for the community, but that's a good start. Yeah, and, and like I say, go on the website and you'll find out even more. So. Um, why don't we talk about a person who is, is caught for uh, a crime, whether they're guilty, innocent, or whatever, uh, and, and they are arrested and they have to go through the process, which is eye-opening from them and possibly traumatic if they haven't been through it before. So, Okay. So what will happen, and really the same thing will happen if someone is in jail or they have been released from the jail or maybe they've just been given a citation or they're under an investigation. We'll start with the jail. Someone is booked into the jail. They will be seen between 5 o'clock in the morning and roughly 8 o'clock in the morning to have a, an interview done. That interview will include that risk assessment tool that I mentioned. It will also be an interview just for the, the accused person to answer some additional questions about their background, their history, all designed to gauge that risk to the community and risk of failure to appear. And, and let, me, let sure. me ask you one thing. In, in case they're watching at the jail tonight, sometimes they watch me. Uh, nobody's going to ask them if they're guilty or absolutely not the facts of the case. Okay. Absolutely not. Will not ask any uh, information related to the case, with the potential exception of the victim, the alleged victim, and that is how they're <coughs> related. Mm -hmm. If it's a, a, a spouse, a an intimate partner, then there will be additional questions relating to that relationship, but not related to the offense. Mm -hmm. Once that um, interview has been done, a report will be forwarded to the judge assigned to the case. So the question might be, why do you do them between 5 o'clock and 8 o'clock in the morning? Those assessments are done early morning because particularly the municipal courts have arraignments early in the morning. 
we need, our goal is to have that um, interview finished, the uh, recommendation with regard to bond to municipal courts before they start their morning arraignments. So that, that time may seem unreasonable for most of us. We may not want to be up at it's 5 o'clock in the sometime. morning. But it, in order for the judge to be informed about bond, they take place in the morning. Now, who does this service? So uh, the, our courts, the general divisions, pretrial services department, mm -hmm. we have a number of individuals who are trained in the risk assessment. They're trained in the factors that relate to failure to appear and that relate to um, risk to the community. And again, they prepare a report, but the ultimate decision is the judges. And so there is still judicial discretion in determining bond. Now, if the individual is out of custody, our bond recommendations are typically based upon historical data, that is um, information that the court has related to that person. It's often not related to an in-person interview. But if the person was not arrested and taken to the jail by the police, mm -hmm. it's probably because the police have in their assessment determined that the individual <coughs> is either not a risk of flight or there's no uh, violence involved. And that's good enough for at present then? Typically, yes. Okay. Now, uh, do the pretrial people tell, tell the defendants, the accused people, what they're going to recommend or do they not? No, they do not because okay. it's the judge's decision. One other factor that I uh, failed to mention before that I think is important is any mental health issues mm -hmm. because particularly if someone is um, currently suffering from some significant mental health issues that can be a risk factor for failure to appear but it can also be a risk factor for the community so that's another issue that that um, that we look at okay so then these reports come to you and the various judges, the Correct. municipal judges, the county judges, whoever uh, has the case of that person, and um, they decide. The judge decides. The law provides that the judge still has discretion, even though there are you know things in Criminal Rule 46 that the judge is required to consider, and even though, for instance, our court uses the verified risk assessment tool even though we're not required to, it is a good predictor or a good tool for the, for the judge to consider. I will say that since we've been using a verified risk assessment tool in Montgomery County, and it's been many years, the number of people who are in jail with a cash bond is dramatically reduced. And I apologize that I can't give you specific statistics, but it's dramatically reduced. Does jail overcrowding factor in in any way? Jail overcrowding really can't factor in. Not supposed to. Um, because we have to look at, at those two sure. risk, really, those primary risk factors, failure to appear and risk to the community. But if we did have jail overcrowding, more likely someone who was completing a sentence mm -hmm. might be out a few days early okay. as opposed to um, someone who, who was a high risk. Okay, so just because the jail is crowded, you're not going to let the axe murderers out uh, because Certainly it seems not. like a good idea. Okay. Certainly not. Again, oh. it's if there was jail overcrowding, and we haven't faced that circumstance um, in terms of being under some court order to reduce the jail po sure. population since I've been on the bench, but certainly the lowest risk persons would be reduced before anyone high of risk course, yeah. would be reduced. Now, when, when or, the, excuse me, released. Okay. Now, in the common police court, there are arraignments on um, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Do you handle any of those at present? N and not currently. We do a rotating schedule for arraignments. Okay. We do those every four months, and it, it's not my turn right now. Okay. Uh, when the judge is handling the arraignments, he gets the report. Uh, the person appears either in person or on TV, I guess. Um, do they do any more than just announce the decision on the bond, or do they allow the 
person to make any comment or put in any what they might consider evidence on this uh, the situation. That's a good question. First of all, I want to address the issue of being on TV. Sure. So any defendant who appears at an arraignment, at least in our court, f via video is because they're in jail right. and they're being held in jail on some bond. Um, so the judge has a, not only the report but also a recommendation from pretrial services about the amount, appropriate amount of bond. We will, you know, hear from the defendant and his attorney. Oftentimes, um, you know, we'll hear uh, very positive things like he, he's lived here his whole life, um, he um, has a job, but we can't verify any, any of that information. Mm -hmm. So typically, typically, but not always, bond will remain the same and we'll ask the lawyer to provide us with verification and then pretrial services will immediately attempt to verify that information okay. because bond can and often is changed based on additional information that we receive. Okay, and um, how often do these uh, matters come to a, an actual hearing where you'd have testimony about the person? Very rarely. I will tell you, um, having been on the bench for 16 years, I've only had two uh, actual bond hearings where mm -hmm. the defendant's counsel requested a full hearing and both of them uh, involved murder cases. Okay. So they're either verified by pretrial services or not verified and things stay uh, the same. If they are verified, sure. uh, different things go into your thinking then. Absolutely. And one of the <coughs> challenges is that I think quite naturally um, sometimes people who are accused of a crime are suspicious when the court asks for information. Mm -hmm. And our sole objective in asking for the information is to determine that individual's risk of appearing in court, failing to appear in court, and risk to the public. And uh, I encourage people to um, sort of disregard their own suspicion about why we want the information, because it's actually there to help them. If you give us information, if, for instance, you can give us a telephone number of the place where you're going to live and mm -hmm. we can call and verify that you can live there, that's going to help you potentially be released on your own recognizance or on a conditional own recognizance. So I understand the sus suspicion, but the more information you're able to give us, the more intelligent the judge's bond decision will be. Um. The factors that are going into uh, Bill 439, which our county, uh, you indicate, has been implementing them uh, for a number of years, has um, its efficiency been tested anywhere? I understand Lucas County has tried it and has been successful in getting people to show up. Uh, the the uh, failure to appear has gone down. So Lucas County is much different from Montgomery County. Okay. Lucas County has been under a federal consent decree to reduce their overcrowded jail for since the 1970s, I believe. And they continued to operate um, with a system that had a bail schedule. Now, for the last several years, under the leadership of Jean Zamuda, who is the administrative judge in uh, the Common Pleas Court there, they have undergone a um, systematic assessment of their, bond, their bail procedures. They are now using a verified risk assessment tool. They're using a different one than we use, mm -hmm. but they're using a verified risk assessment tool. They have a number of procedures in place that attempt to... Um, release as many people on uh, COR as, or OR as is appropriate based upon risk as opposed to here's a bond schedule and we just go off this schedule. So they are doing a lot of uh, really creative things, but I will tell you that we have been doing many of those things for many years. For instance, again, we use a verified risk assessment tool, just happens to be a different tool than they use in Lucas County but we are, um, be, we are using a tool. We have um, 
have a, a large pretrial services department that does these assessments. Again, Lucas County implemented that a couple of years ago. Um, but we've also learned from some things from Lucas County. They, they're, they're uh, two administrative judges from their municipal court mm -hmm. and their common police court came down here about 10 days ago and you know, gave us some ideas about things that we could do better. Mm -hmm. And we are in the process of, with a large committee, um, reviewing some of the things they're doing and about how we can incorporate them and make our system, which I think is, is very good, into an even better one. The people who do these um, assessments from the pretrial services, um, do they have any special training in these things other than just keeping doing them? And obviously sure. you get some information doing it that way. Well, certainly it's important that they be trained in not only what the risk <laughs> assessment tool asks for, but also those sort of intangible things. You know, things like I mentioned, mm -hmm. if you interview someone and they, from their appearance, have very clearly been involved in recent substance abuse, you know, they need to be able to identify those factors, um, other similar issues. But most of the pretrial services officers have a background in criminal justice, a degree in criminal justice, or something okay. similar. So they do have not only their education, but we provide them with specific training in what are best practices in, um, in assessment. Okay. Now, you have talked about the risk assessment tool um, in various factors. Um, tell us what some of the factors are uh, that go into that to help assure the person showing up and uh, keeping the community from being at risk. We have no assurance. So I may have an assessment of an individual that suggests that they are low risk to, re to um, a, of um, a danger to the community, low risk of failure to appear, mm -hmm. and we can't find them for five years and they go out and commit a lot more crime. An assessment tool is just a tool. It is somewhat predictive, but it is not going to predict everything. There was a judge on our court 18 years ago who had an individual who was low risk, uh, charged with an offense against his former wife, low, appeared to be low risk. Um, that individual was released on bond. He then killed his ex-wife and two other people. That low risk assessment is never going to predict exactly what's going to happen. Again, it's just a tool. Unless you assess them every day, I guess. Huh? I'm sorry? Unless you assess them every day. And that's not possible. No, of course we, not. We, not only do not, we not have the resources, that um, could never fulfill the objective of bond. So now people who are at high risk, even if they are out on maybe electronic home detention mm -hmm. or a conditional own recognizance, the, the research does demonstrate that monitoring that person, whether it's through electronic home detention or GPS monitoring or having them see a pretrial services officer maybe once or twice a week or even checking in daily can reduce, reduce the risk of that individual. Is it ever going to take all the risk away? Yeah. Absolutely not. Are there some studies on this that show that Ohio could actually save some money by doing this? I, I don't feel like I'm prepared to answer that because I, there are... Um, you said $67 million, maybe? Well, there are, there are studies that suggest yeah. that there is savings in really two general areas. One is savings from the cost of, of keeping people in jail, which is very mm -hmm. significant. The other savings is the human cost, and by that I mean, and I think we've mentioned this, the, the cost of an individual who's in jail, who loses their job, loses their housing, may, whether they lose custody of their children or their children then um, become a cost to the community through foster care or otherwise because their parent is in jail. Mm -hmm. So there, there could be 
tremendous cost savings. But there should be a recognition by the funding sources, whether it's county commissioners, uh, city commissions, city councils, that there will be an upfront cost to make some of these changes and, and implement these innovations. We recently, actually within the last few days, advertised for three additional pretrial services officers so that we could more adequately assist the city of Dayton in their uh, bond recommendations. Mm -hmm. There's going to be an initial cost uh, for these three additional right. persons, but down the line there should be a reduction in the number of people in jail on bond and then those, those human costs that we mentioned. So it's going to be an upfront cost, but there should be then a future cost savings. Is that part of a, an empirical model study? Um, there have been many, many studies. Okay. And, and you're going to get a variety of different results based on the quality of the study, but there is plenty of data that mm -hmm. there is cost savings. But we don't want cost savings to be what drives pretrial reforms. It should really be, are we accurately and adequately looking at risk as opposed to whether it's ability to pay or some, some easy schedule that we have. Do, do the people providing the money, the, the commissioners, people like that, are they approving of, of these uh, reforms or measures I mean, I, I as far don't want, as you know? I don't want to speak for anybody else, but it's my impression that, um, and this is purely my impression, that the funding sources, at least locally, mm -hmm. are committed to an intelligent, informed bail decision as opposed to a bail decision that's based on some arbitrary schedule that doesn't appreciate risk. So again, I don't want to speak for them, but I, no, I, have, I'm, I have the impression that yes, they're, they're committed to, and I, and I will say that the Montgomery County Commissioners have, um, again, recently approved additional funds for us to hire three additional pretrial services officers. I think that signals, at least in some respect, right. their commitment. I, again, I don't want to speak for them, but it certainly demonstrates that commitment. Well, they're not turning a thumbs down on the thing and saying no. this is a here. They've been very scheme. open to um, to our efforts, and uh, again, the city of Dayton. You know, I have to speak uh, very highly of their judges and their efforts mm -hmm. to um, to institute many of these reforms that we've talked about. Now, as as we've said before, all the eighty-eight counties are they have their own ways of doing things, and I'm not going to ask you what everybody does. Uh, but as we talked before, some of the counties don't have any money; they don't have any pretrial services and they might be stuck with uh, uh, the system they got. Um, will pushing the bill through um, and maybe passing it uh, force, force them to do that or is it going to bankrupt them? It, it could force them to do some things, yeah. but you know, I mentioned at the outset that, that actually Judge Logan and I from uh, Dayton Municipal Court were at the Midwest um, pretrial mm -hmm. innovation seminar last week. And one of the themes that I think is really important from that seminar was culture change. We have to have a systematic culture change in this country that while cash bonds sometimes may be appropriate, the, um, in most circumstances, the more appropriate bond is owner cognizance or conditional owner cognizance, mm -hmm. that is a bond with conditions. And until we have that culture change, legislation may push people towards some reforms, um, but we have to change our mindset. There, there, there will be a cost. There, yeah. there are um, counties in this state that are financially challenged. Um, and We're absorbing the cost so far. Are in we? Montgomery County? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. But again, we have resources in Montgomery County that smaller counties 
Don't are probably never going to have. Yeah. So the cost is a factor. The legislation that is pending relating to bail, modifications of bail procedures and rules relating to bail um, could be challenging to implement, again, in smaller counties. We've been doing it for so long. Again, we need to make some changes to make things better, to enhance what we're doing. But those counties that, that don't have a pretrial system or procedure or personnel are really going to be challenged. One last thing then. We're, we're down to a minute here. Okay. So does, does this sort of say that the bigger counties with money to do this, uh, justice is going to be better as far as bail uh, for them than in the tiny rural counties? I hope not. But if we look at what uh, resources we have, whether it's Lucas County, as we mentioned, or in Montgomery County, or Franklin County, where they're doing a lot of these same things, um, what we're experiencing today may very well indicate that a bond in a smaller county will be much different than what you'd experience in a county that has the resources. Okay. It's been great having you Thank here you. in evening with Judge Huffman. Thank you. Um, We've run out of time, viewing audience. This has been a production of You and the Law. We've been talking about bail reform, as I've told you many times with Judge Mary Kate Huffman. Um, I want to thank all the volunteers behind the scenes who've made this program possible. And um, I've been your producer and host. We're going to have a shout out to Lily, Katie, and Everett. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next time on You and the Law. Good night.